Hello one and all, and welcome to Behind the Glass. I'm your host, Sam, from the YouTube channel Seen Through Glass. And I'm Tony from Gravelwood Car Sales. Yes, you are. Uh, each week we get together, we talk about cars, motorsport, F1, car, what else? Cars? Cars. We cars, talk about cars, cars. We? <laughs> <laughs> You can listen to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts. You can watch us on YouTube.com forward slash Behind the Glass. Don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications. And Tony, if people want to support this podcast, what should they do? Watch it. No. <laughs> <laughs> but also head to Patreon. You can support us on patreon.com forward slash behind the glass. Thanks for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed the episode. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we are joined this week by Tim Marlowe from Magnitude Finance. Hello all. Thank you so much for gracing us with your, with your presence. Tesla managed to get down here as well. That's a lie. Didn't Only joking, I got a train. I was going to say, yeah, you, don't want, oh. you don't want to start that fight at the beginning. Uh, those of you, well, we should declare the fact that, that Tim does drive a Tesla Model X. Model X with the, with the Urban kit on it as well. Oh, with the I, Urban I, kit, I does that make it? it up, yeah. Okay, is, is it any more? It makes it even more I was, I was going to say, like, <laughs> I don't know what that means, really. Um, but of course, yeah, coming here today, Tony's first question was, did you make it down here today? And uh, Tim said, no, I took the train. <laughs> which, which, please, Tony. Yeah, he loves around. me really, he really does. <laughs> no, another form of electric though. Trains? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Are you joking? I don't want to put oh, my foot no. I don't want to put my foot in it. You just have. Um, I'll just go, I'll say that more. <laughs> Trains? Yeah. <laughs> this fully electric. Of course. Really? Absolutely. Yeah. We're not oh, in steam engines. Really now. My mum's oh, going, I spent all that money on that education. <laughs> my dad's gonna be fuming. Oh god. I genuinely thought coal. Cole! <laughs> I'm joking, why are you up there now? Uh, but anyway, look, everyone, welcome to our latest episode. I say we're thrilled to have Tim with us. Um, friend of the channel, friend of the podcast, I say returning guest. Um, but I feel like over the last six months or so, quite a few occasions, Tony and I have said, oh, we should get Tim on, we should ask Tim about that. And also, you were very helpful when we were, when we were getting SF90 quotes a few weeks ago. So um, yeah, just great to have you here with us so we can throw the odd financing question towards you when we start getting excited about some of the cars we're going to be talking about today. Um, quickly though just another reminder about our live events because I think I sold I think we sold them very badly last week we actually forgot to describe what the live events were and some people thought they were live streams <laughs> no we, we are we're actually going to be an audience we're going to be throwing open the doors mm. um, so basically uh, we've got our first one this Sunday Tony are you ready for that I'm ready. I think I'm ready too. I've got to get my hair cut, but anyway. Um, so yeah, first one this Sunday, and then we've got three more events this year at the moment in the diary. 25th of July, 5th of September, and 12th of September. And essentially, on a Sunday morning, starting at 9am, uh, we are welcoming audience members to bring cool cars along here to STGHQ, the Duke of London space, the factory in Brentford, for a bit of a cars and coffee style morning. We'll have a display on, we'll walk around, drink STG coffee, eat have we snacks. Have got any cool cars coming? We actually have some great cars coming this weekend. There's a G GT3 coming. Lovely. Some GTS coming. What else is coming? I've probably got the list somewhere. I'll oh. reveal them all. No, I shouldn't reveal them all. Um, but yes, yeah, a bit of a sort of, you know, cars and coffee thing where Tony will go around probably slagging off most of the things you bought or trying no. to buy most yeah, of the things. Right. <laughs> trying to buy them. Buy them all. Tim, do you want to come down and do finance quotes for everyone? <laughs> you are a little bit short of stock, aren't you, the moment, Tony? <laughs> Extremely, yeah. Mm, I'm not really going to bother talking about it this week because every week I say, please, 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 I need some stock. So we'll give it a rest for a couple of weeks and I'll be back. You'll be back this weekend going up to people saying, how much can I buy your car for? Um, but yes, yeah, a bit of cars coffee and then we'll head upstairs to the main showroom at Duke of London for a live podcast. And that means Tony and I will be doing the podcast with a live audience that people can get involved ask questions, do bits and bobs, and then afterwards we'll probably just all go get a pizza, yep. I guess. So, what, yeah. half ten in the morning? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Why not, Tony? So yes, if you're interested, head over to my website, seenthroughglass.com forward slash, I think it's behind the glass live, or if you go to seenthroughglass.com, you'll see there's an event section. One more time, 25th of July, 5th of September, and 12th of September. We hope to see many of you there. This weekend is now sold out. Oh yeah, actually... Some of them are very nearly sold out because we're limited on numbers at the moment because of COVID restrictions. Yeah. We're very close to our limits, but we're hoping to increase those. But yeah, if you want tickets, go now. Cause what have you done the limits on on the next dates? Uh, 50, 50. So right, th this Sunday's 30, the next three are 50. We're hoping to increase that if possible in terms Good. of numbers. But Good. I think the 5th of September is very nearly sold out. Should we get on to some car news? <laughs> now, now we've got that admin out of the way. Tim's like, why did I come here to listen to <laughs> talk about their live events? How boring. <laughs> Um, so there is big, big news in the world of Ferrari that we have to discuss because last week, finally, Ferrari pulled back the covers of a new car that I think us Ferrari fans, but maybe the world has been waiting for for a while, the return of the Dino, in inverted commas. 
we now know called the 246 GTB. 296. 296. 296. <laughs> You're all right, mate. Yep. I had my he's second been, COVID been jab. For it for that long. <laughs> I had my second COVID jab last week and I'm really ropey today. <laughs> we did swap the, chairs. Honestly, we did the F1 <laughs> podcast this morning and I was like, uh, uh, Mega Hackenden did a great. Uh, anyway, so <laughs> a driver from 20 years ago. Thank you. 296. <laughs> um, uh, but yes, this is, I think people thought was going to be. A sort of new baby Ferrari, right? I think that was the kind of word on the street. Well, it is. No, it's not. Why do you think it is? Well, it's smaller than the SF90. So it's baby. It sits above the F8, though. In terms of price and performance. performance. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> so, yeah, I think people assumed that it was going to be, as I say, like the Dino back in the day, V6, small, maybe priced alongside a Roma or the Portofino, and a bit kind of entry-level mid-engine Ferrari. But Ferrari went... No, <laughs> and instead... Why, why bring it in cheap when you can charge loads of money for it? There you go. I feel like, Tim, you're on the board at Ferrari because you <laughs> seem to understand them very well. Um, that's exactly it. I think they've realised that there's potential to go big and it's their first hybrid V6 ever? Yeah. Just is it, checking. Do we, do we think that's loosely based on the Julia Quadrifoglio engine? No. I think what people were suggesting it might be based on is the new MC20 Maserati engine. Fair enough. But they've all come out saying, no, it's completely different. That's a lie. (laughs) Which I think (laughs) probably probably is a lie. Um, (laughs) Now, stylistically, I liked a lot of elements about this car. Mm. They look look good. Yeah, look good, right? Inspiration from the 250LM and uh, a few other sort of Ferrari special one-off projects. Um, I didn't like, well, firstly, that it might cost over 250 grand, 880-odd horsepower? What, what what part did you like about that? Sounds That's, good to me. No, come too much. Who needs that? Well, everything's been too much over the last five or six years. It, it you know you're not if if it was six hundred horsepower, I don't want to buy it. It's got. It's do got, you actually believe that? Well, mate, come on. Manufacturers do not build cars with less horsepower than the previous model. Yeah, they're not going backwards. Are they're they? not going backwards. No, but there is no previous model. No, it's a is. new model. It's a good starting range though. <laughs> only go up from there. Exactly. <laughs> um, I just think it, it's unnecessary. I think, you know, okay, fine. They're competing against the McLaren Artura, right? Which we know has already got big figures and binder numbers. And they had to go big if they're going to kind of position this below SF90 and above F8 as they have done. It's a hybrid. It's green. <laughs> What's unnecessary about it? All right, Tesla lover. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just think if they had made it 600 horsepower as the V6 element is... In total, forget the added power that you get from the electric. I just think it would have been just more exciting. I think I struggle. I liked the idea. I liked the um, uh, inspiration that they had taken to get to that point of that car. But I just walked away feeling a bit cold, just going, ugh, ugh. No, I think these manufacturers have all lost their way anyway, to be honest. I think they're all, you know, they're all going on numbers now. We we spoke so many times before about how much power all these cars have got and how unnecessary they are. And we spoke briefly last week about the Turbo S and that's too fast. So what's this new car going to be? You know, but they're always chasing numbers. These manufacturers and that that's just the the way they all behave now because it's a headline. It's a marketing tool, mate. It's like the Nurburgring. It's like well, we got the fastest lap record around the Nurburgring. It's literally to sell cars. That, that's the reason why. It's not one of their own numbers, it's the competitors' numbers as of well, course. isn't it? Of course. Yeah. Looking yeah. at what else is that? You've mentioned McLaren already, haven't you? Yeah, of course. I, I get that, and, and that's the way of the world at the moment, isn't it? It's not like Ferrari have done this and no other manufacturer has. It's said yeah, they're competing in that space and they've got to deliver. But, for example, the SF90 is often sort of mocked for being too powerful. Who needs a 1,000 horsepower on the road? And people have said this so many times, and I just feel like they've done that again with this new car, uh, and, okay, so SF90, apart from us, Tim, <laughs> quoting it up, have you had many of those come through? Have you? We've not done too many of those. Which doesn't surprise me, because we talk about this very often. They're all on Auto Trader. <laughs> I mean, you know, they're, they're, it's one of those cars that people don't seem to really have fallen in love with or appreciate that much. And I worry that's exactly what Ferrari have done here again with this 296, that, okay, oh, we like the idea of it, and yes, it's linking back to the heritage, and it looks pretty, and looks beautiful. But actually, do we need it? No, let's go buy 430 Scuds. We don't, but you can guarantee they'll sell out. But have they sold out of SF90s? No, 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 the miles off. The difference between the SF90 and this new car is at 200 grand. 
You don't know that. It's 250 plus, apparently. Yeah, so it'd be 300, 320, that, that sort of money. They, they will sell them, mate. I've got, yeah, I mean, of course, that's something that's right. I'll be trying to buy one. <laughs> Everything I said right now, I'll be calling Tim up in two years' time. It's like, oh, oh, five grand deposit. Oh. The biggest problem with, with Ferrari, I think they've got now, is that years gone by, they never used to compete with anyone. They were Ferrari. This is our car. The Speciale is a really good example of that. They, di- they, don't care, they don't care about Nürburgring times and stuff. We're Ferrari. But now, I think they've probably have to, had to change their strategy slightly. And I think they do have to compete power-wise now, which is why we're seeing these astronomical you know, power increases in all these brands now. So I guess the question is, is that the death of the mid-engine V8 from Ferrari? Do we think that, that, that the F8 will slowly die out and it won't be replaced? Or do we think that there's still going to be something sitting now below this 296? Well, the, the, the F8 was always the stopgap car for the hybrid car to come, right? So I, I was under the assumption that the next car coming was the V8 hybrid car to take the F8. Because the F8 is probably not going to be made for much longer. It was only because the... The hybrid car wasn't ready, but they have got the technology now because you've got the FS90 and this 296 thing. See, it's hard to remember. <laughs> it's, it <was laughs> went it's a numbers game, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it really is. Um, but no, this is the thing is that, yeah, I see the F8 as more of a swan song for that engine, you know, as a tribute to that engine. Um, and you're right, you know, the last hurrah before potentially adding hybrid. But I'm now looking at it going, well, actually, how would they position another mid-engine V8. Okay, fine. Pricing for the 296 hasn't been confirmed yet. And also what hasn't been confirmed is whether the F8 is getting replaced. All we know is that they're not stopping the F8 production. This this new car is not a replacement for the F8. But does that mean there is a replacement or is this going to quietly fade in the background like the Lusso? The Lusso is just gone into the ether, never to be spoken yeah. about again. I think, I think there will be a V8. I think there'll be a V6, a V8, and then the SF90. And I think they'll go in 75 grand, 100 grand, increments in terms of price so i don't i don't really mind you the v8 is the sf90 i understand that but you know is there room for them to have a 900 horsepower one in the middle at 350 well let's see where the pricing comes out because you know you do have roma and portofino now at what specced up what 220 230 for those cars i don't know what what they come through at as uh yeah yeah, spec'd up, they're sort of 230 ish. Yeah, something like that. The the thing that we always have to look back on, and it's not really that hard to, to look back in terms of pricing, when you look back at Ferrari over the years, they always go up in like 20, 30 grand increments from the old model, essentially. That's normally how they sit and price them. So um, if you look at uh, 458 it was 180 something and then the 488 was just over 200 and then the Pista's another 30 grand on top of that and this new car will probably be another 20, 30 grand on top of that I would think so that's normally how they increment them essentially well, let's watch the space. There's always room for more, isn't there, with Ferrari? I guess so. And as you said, there's always demand. Like, that's the thing, right? They've got that customer base and, and an ever-growing and stronger customer base in Asia and parts of the UAE. So, but you know, is that got the case now? Is, I, is that the case anymore, mate? The, do you think that the Asian market isn't as strong? In general. I, I, I just don't think that the same level of customer is there anymore. This is uh, unprecedented times, what we're in at the moment. But in general... We were talking about this 18 months ago that supercars were on their ass. In general, you know, mm. it's not just Ferrari. We've got all these manufacturers making so many different variants of a supercar. And I think it's a problem. I think, you know, going back 10 years, there was probably three or four Ferraris. I bet there's eight or nine now. Yeah, something we talk about a lot, you know, the mm. fact that Lamborghini are really doing a great job of doing not very much. Correct. It, you know, they're, they're really the only sort of supercar brand out there to this day that are just kind of have a simplified or very simple model lineup, a very clear offering, and have stayed true to what they sort of always represented, which is kind of being a little bit crazy, a little bit out there, a little bit intense. Yeah. Whilst all these others are trying to slowly start sort of blowing, blurring lines in terms of how the cars behave, their personalities, their characteristics, their offerings. Um I don't know with Ferrari. I think I think yes, the market is still strong for them. I think definitely in those, you know, parts of the world, say Asia, UAE. I think I think the strength of the brand there is is huge. I know when uh, Tim Shmi went out to Dubai 
over Christmas, every third car was an F8, he was saying. Yeah. Well, here they kind of get slightly overlooked. Mm. Um, but I think there are parts of the world where they're, they're, their new cars are still performing very, very well. They need, they need to make an SUV because from a ma- manufacturer's point of view, an SUV costs pennies to make in terms of the whole... the whole To make a supercar and to, and to, to run it because it's not real mass market, their profit per unit is not that high. This why Lamborghini are doing so well because they make an SUV which they've copied from the the VAG platform, and it doesn't cost a lot to develop and make in terms of compared to a supercar. So and they sell millions of them. So look, look at the price point on that. That is just sticking, isn't it? We're doing so many of those at the moment. You just yeah yeah because ama- they can't make amazing, enough of them. Amazing car. Yeah. yeah yeah they can't make enough of them. And then you look at Aston Martin the other way the D the was it the DB DBX DBX yeah yeah. yeah. I've read so much to, into that. Hmm, yeah, <laughs> that was supposed to save the company, and it and, and it just hasn't. No, so it's just awful. Yeah, so just not a fan of the car. Well, speaking of Aston Martin, actually, there was a there is a car that we can talk about. Oh, Martin. I actually. Oh, oh there is. Got excited. What have you got excited about <laughs> Aston? Aston? You have just thrown me off yeah. so much. That's the first time you have ever foamed at the mouth when I've said Aston Martin. Yes, because I had this conversation with Paul Wallace a couple of years ago and said if Aston Martin made a Vantage, I hope it's the car we're going to talk about. I don't think it is, but go, <laughs> on. <laughs> go on. Go on, If Aston Martin made a Vantage to compete with a GT3, that would interest me. So Aston Martin of a have announced this Vantage F1. You know, you don't know about. I this. mean, they. What do you mean? I don't know about this, Tony. We spoke about this five months ago when the car was unveiled. Oh, oh, <laughs> Re- really? You, I just. So where was I? I then? really don't like you. No. <laughs> and also, it's not a GT3. No, but but it's it, it's a little bit like one though. It's really not. Oh, but that's it's what they're a putting, It's a Vantage with a wing. Yeah, but that's what they're putting up against. They put, they're they're going to compare it to a GT3. Who? But, but that All wasn't the, the Aston you were going to mention, was it? No, I, I'm going to come back to okay. the Aston. I'm oh, going to just checking. Just no. checking. <laughs> Thanks. Keeping us on track. I'm glad you're here too. Yeah. No, wait. Go on. <laughs> I'm so confused <laughs> by you. We're still, you still, like, still waiting. <laughs> I'm starting to question whether this is like a post-second vaccination trip I'm on. No, it's not. I... For, uh, so more than uh, magazines and the write-ups, that's what they're comparing it to. They're comparing it with the GT3. Even like, why um, are you so excited? Do you want Tim to do a quote on one for you? No, no, no. no are you no, sure? No, because no, I know what they, I know what they'll do. Because at one point a few months ago, you were contemplating buying a Vantage. No, oh, I, I looked at them, didn't I? <laughs> you did. Did I buy one though? No. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I don't see the Vantage F1. I would have to Google it to, to double check, but as far as I know, it is a wing. Is a little bit stiffer suspension. No, more down. Is a livery a little bit more downforce. Yeah. I, I don't see that as a GT3 rival. I mean, I've been saying forever an Aston GT3 or, I mean, which is which we saw, GT8 and GT12 from the old shape, or an F-type GT3 is much needed. But these are cars that are supposed to be Grand Tours. They're supposed to be luxury, comfortable, plush Grand Tours. They're not made for thrashing around the track. So I think that Vantage F1, well, it's a bit of a gimmick. Someone's drunk the Kool-Aid if that journalist is saying it goes up against GT3 because we all know in this room <laughs> which is going to be faster around the track. Of course. Yeah, so... I'm glad you got excited by it, though. Uh, we're going to talk about the car that I meant to talk about, which is way more relevant. Okay. The Valkyrie AMR Pro. Oh, that's not good. <laughs> uh, is it, are you buying one, Tim? It might compete with a GT3. <laughs> 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 oh, my God. Cutting. So, do you remember 35 years ago when Aston Martin revealed the, the Valkyrie? Um, you, 35? It was genuinely that long ago. It wasn't born. And, but it was genuinely that long ago. <laughs> That's how long that car's been in production. Yeah. Um, or, you know, nearing production. They also revealed the sort of, the race car variant because their whole plan was to go to Le Mans, right? Like that yep. was the whole thing. So I, I do think they inici- initially showed this AMR Pro version, I think it was three or so years ago. The final production variant, which has now been confirmed, even though the road going Valkyrie is still not out and available, uh, is actually an iteration of the car that was going to go to Le Mans. So it's even more extreme, pushed even further, and with all the sort of Le Mans regulations ripped away. So it's the ultimate track toy, theoretically. I mean, what was the standard Valkyrie? Who knows? It's one of those cars that's just gone, huh? Do you think they've just bypassed the standard one? I just don't even know what's going on. No, they don't know. We, we, I, we had a few people talking about orders, but it was three, four years ago. I, I know people who've been cancelling them because it's taken so long or they've been going in one direction and they keep asking for more money. But I went with my friend to spec uh, his Valkyrie and at the time you could buy Shelf. different body... 
Was this 35 years ago? <laughs> it was 35 years ago. Um, <laughs> you could buy different body shells for on track, off track. They were also talking about selling the cars that were then going to go on to Le Mans so you could buy the actual race car, blah, blah, blah. Sounds like an expensive Meccano kit. <laughs> yeah, but this is the whole thing, right? It was all a bit, at the time I was like, this all sounds a bit mad. Like, is this actually all going to happen? And then obviously in comes Mr. Stroll and a Le Mans program gets ditched. Valkyrie is still seemingly testing at Silverstone every day, but not apparently getting any closer to being a production car. Like, what is that about? Um, it's die out. And then, as I say, whilst they still haven't even confirmed anything about the road car, they're like, oh, but you can have the AMR Pro. Just give us 500 grand now. Yeah, that, I mean, that's that's the biggest thing. All these all these, uh, these hyper, new hyper cars, they've got all these people's money. All the, Mercedes, the same. I mean... Are they, gonna, are they ever going to make it? They're just going to give it back or, you know. I think that's hell. it, right? I think I think it's just a way to, to secure more money, more funding. If they yeah. can sell a few AMR Pros, it will actually allow them to maybe finish the actual Valkyrie, which I, I really want them to do because what a cool idea that car was from day one. It just doesn't seem to be getting any closer to reality. Like, I just, I want that car because it looks nuts. But apart from JWW filming some stuff at you Silverstone. You want it? Well, I want to experience it. Oh. Man, it looks just, that looks we more like a Formula your One credit car. Rating, so. Yeah. <laughs> please don't reveal that on the podcast. <laughs> Keep that one on a download, please. <laughs> um, but, you know, that looks more like a Formula One car than the AMG Project One. Yeah, I know what one I'd rather have, though. You have the Merc? 100% because it'll work. Which one would you have? Tim? Pro- Project One or? Um, Project One. Really? Because yeah, it'll work, mate. Oh, I'm going Valkyrie. Merce- the Mercedes week. won't release a car unless it definitely works. Aston Martin are more than happy to release yeah. a car. <laughs> <laughs> Even if it don't work. But I quite like a car that doesn't work all the time because it's we a, know. More, a bit more character. From more... your car history. <laughs> There's three of them downstairs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, okay, fine. Well, we'll move on quickly because there was something quite interesting which we were discussing during the week which I wanted to bring back up on the podcast. Uh, when Porsche unveiled the new 992 GTS, mm-hmm. which was quite quiet. You know, obviously there wasn't a lot of sort of fanfare around it. The GT3 Touring specification got unveiled literally five days before and then just sort of quietly, they're like, oh, and the GTS is available too. Uh, and you posed the question, Tony, um, of surely, or not surely, but is there potential that the GTS is actually the better car to have? It's more available, probably better for the road, a bit cheaper, blah, 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 blue, blue, blue. I can't remember your other points. And I spec them up online. 10 grand difference between the GTS and the GT3 on my specifications. I'd have the GT3 because of the engine. But so would I, obviously. But what right. I'm trying to say is, is that not not everyone can get a GT3. So when they go onto the onto the black market, onto the used market, onto the black market. They're not they're not they're not going to be 9 or 10 grand difference. They're going to be 70 or 80 grand difference. That's Fair. the point I was trying to make. Well, I didn't have enough caption in the in the tweet. My point being, if it was the same as the Cayman, where you could have the four litre in either GTS or GT4 format, I'm so with you, right? It's like messaging me the other day. It's like, if we can take this off and put this on and do this, no, and no, do this it's but, like perfect. But, <laughs> <laughs> because the GTS doesn't have the same engine. No. So even though the values that, like, the whole specialness about the GT3 amongst suspension, all these different elements, is that engine. And you're of just course. not getting that in the GTS. So. Yes, okay, the value is inherently going to be more once they end up on the used market, but I do, don't think... Do you think there's premiums going to be there, the used market, for the new, yeah, for the yeah, new GT3? Yeah. yeah, 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 for sure. I mean, the the old ones are still over list, mm. mate, with, you know, they're four year old coming up with 10,000 miles on them, and they're still over list retail. Yeah. So, yeah, they, 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 you know, they just find their market. The only problem I'm having with them now is that when I bought my free RS, it was 160 with options. The new car is going to be over two hundred grand list. So, what with a few options? With some options, I spec one up online. I got one hundred and forty odd. What for oh, GT three? No, I'm no, talking GT3. about free RS. Oh, the sorry, new, sorry. Yeah, okay. sorry, sorry. Yeah, 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 I'm yeah. talking about free RS. So the the new one. I mean, a, a Visac car of the of the you know the current car. Sure, it's like one late one eighties, one ninety. Okay, so yeah, fully spec up three RS. Yeah, okay. Then then they're, they're not. But then when you compare it to the to the competitor, the Lamborghini, the Merc, the 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 Ferrari, they're all three hundred plus. So, but you know, people buy Porsches because they're really, really good value. As you start incrementing prices, they then become not value anymore. I mean, it becomes too much. Yeah, I think become, good, good good value at the start, but also good value at the end. Yeah, that they're, that they're holding the values, aren't they? They do, yeah. And when you think how many they make as well, um, um, you know, they make thousands and thousands and thousands of them. So, and everyone always fights over them, and they, you know, they, they 
they do one thing really well that everyone wants to do in them. So, and to be fair, over the years, GTSs have held as well. Uh, well, I say as well as GT3s. Okay, five GT3s are getting big overs. GTSs have always historically had pretty good resist. I mean, I've got you know, one in stock now. I've a got GTS. A, I've got a three, yeah, point two. I've got a right. three year old point two PDK with. A nearly every option in GT Silver with 8,000 miles on did, it. When did you get this? The other day. I don't tell you keep, every keep, car. Keep going, because I can see why you should have told me, but keep going. Go on. Are you thinking of part exchange or something? So? <laughs> Tim, you know better than most. I definitely am. Go on. So, um, How yeah, much? Free How much? 93 grand. So that, 93 grand? Yeah. So okay, that you're, car you're would, a prick. That, that car would have been 110 new, maybe a little bit more, 112. So during the week when I was sending you links to 991.2 GTSs going, what a car, I'm not really sure why, but I think I really want one of these at the moment. Like, what a good thing. You didn't think to think, I've got one for you, sir. No. He was just buying one before the podcast. No, no. I'd, so I'd, he could I'd, market it. No, I'd, I'd, Paul took a picture of it last week. Remember when he well, Good down? for Paul. No, no, no. What I mean <laughs> is that, that he come down and done a video last week and, and my photographer was off um, on holiday and Paul helped me take some pictures and he took a picture of it. So... All right. I should have probably said <laughs> Probably should have said at the time when I'm saying oh, I'm really liking the idea of a 991.2 GTS. But yeah. okay, cheers, Tony. Yeah. Um, anyway, my point being that, yeah, we've seen over the years, both those cars, their values can be incredibly strong. Uh, and so I, I always understand that there's that kind of dilemma of, oh, GTS versus GT3. Oh, GTS is actually just, you know, it's really good road car, blah, blah. But I think in, yeah, in current form, when you're going turbo versus naturally aspirated, for me, the balance now wet, like you know, leans towards GT3, if I could walk in and, yeah. and buy both. and I, and I and I honestly will say this: people will probably go, "No, you're talking crap." But as actual two machines, the GTS is the better road car because it's a bit more effortless, it's softer. You know, if you take the engine out, because you know you're a pure, but to drive every day, you can drive the GT3 every day. You wouldn't want to, but you can if you want. If they were two tools to drive every day, the GTS is a better car. And probably you say. Road, it's probably a better engine on the road. Correct. Because the torque curve will be a bit stronger. Otherwise, you've got to rev that GT3 out like no end. And then you're speeded and then you're going to lose your licence. Boom. Boom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that boom. Um, Tim, because we knew you were coming, uh, I did let the patrons sort of submit some questions because I'll say, we have definitely said over the last three, four, five months, oh, we've got to ask Tim about that. And we've completely forgotten what those things were. So we've relied on our patrons to come up with some questions for you because I thought it was worthwhile um, whilst you're here to go some, get in on some finance. Um, So uh, to kick things off, Ollie Maslin has asked a question, which I think is quite interesting. Maybe you don't have the answer to. Are there some cars at the minute that have really strong residuals? I mean, we probably just talked about them, GT3 and GTS, things like that. Are there some cars you're seeing that sort of standing out to you or things that might surprise people that actually have pretty strong residuals and therefore can be quite attractive finance propositions? I think a lot of what we're doing, certainly at the top end, we've mentioned the, the, the two cars, the 911 and then the Eurus. The Eurus? The Eurus is just, uh, yeah. Just wow. Can't get hold of them. I still list. Yeah. One, Used cars. One came on the market at uh, dealers the other day and custom went to buy it. Next morning, gone already. Whoa. I mean, they're all over the place in London. That I see even, them all that, the time. even at a tan interior as well. What's wrong with a tan yep, interior? Went straight away. What's wrong with a tan interior? And he said that because Jack. <laughs> I know. You just winding me up. Okay, well, you yeah, scraped so the wheel on that, Jack. Oh, I, t- I pointed that out as well. I just, I saw that and I thought... Why did you have to bring that up? Did you say wheel or wheels? No, wheels. Yeah. And, and wait a minute, you done it. I know, I did you can't You can't blame Vicky. No, 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 I didn't. I, but because I, you would. The only, I don't have an excuse, but there's a width restriction which I go through, which is the Albert Bridge width restriction. Anyone in London will know that's a very tight one. I've been going through it for 15 years, every single day. So I know I like inside out. But I went to film with that car at 4, 5 a.m. the other morning. And as I was going through it, this is not an excuse, a cyclist went up the inside of the width restriction rather than the cycle lane. So I swerved a little bit left to let him through and then... You swerved? Well... You didn't want to knock him off? No, I didn't oh. want to knock him off. It's not I've a done thing. It's, it's, it's not the done thing. <laughs> oh. So, realistically, what I should have done, I should have just slammed on the brakes and yelled, but I, I swear. Anyway, it was early in the morning. What did I do? I curbed some wheels. We'll get them fixed. We digress. Don't know why you had to bring that up, but anyway, you actually what? curbed one of your wheels in your pickup truck just now, moving out of the. No, I didn't. You did. No, I didn't and you had to spin some wheels to get I some grip. I didn't, I didn't curb the wheel, mate, because we'll it's got to, really big tyres on it. We'll so. go and check afterwards. Uh, um, okay. <laughs> can't have it, can he? <laughs> I can't believe you just tried to like, land me in it just then. <laughs> yeah, you can. Right, well. We both did. We both, did. We, we both noticed it, didn't we? Yeah, straight away. Day-to-day cars, BMW, BMW M2. 
M- M2s are uh, that's much. what I was about to ask. Yeah. Is there anything like which is yeah, a bit yeah. more hot hatchy yeah. or, or okay? So M2s have pretty strong residuals. We've seen loads of those still in the calculator at the moment. And comps. I was going to say yeah, comps, comps. CS. Like one is top. Yep. Show off. Okay, so Eurus, GT3, and M2. A35 be another one. Yeah, not quite as many, but yeah. Mm. Yeah, the, the, the hot hatches. And what about, so this is kind of Ollie's second follow-up question, which I wanted to ask as well. What about the sort of modern classic market? Something that we talk about so much, right? And over the last year or so, used cars, we're all seeing the demand and, and even the prices now go through the roof. How does that affect your world? So, you know, 458, is that a good example? Tony, help me out. Something that basically dropped off a little bit over the last two years, but it's now picking back up. Um, I was going to say, but def- define what you think the, the modern modern classics are. I, I would say last, well... I'm, I'm over gonna, 10 years. Well, that's even harder. Like how, for example, maybe this is another question, how do you finance a Carrera GT or an Enzo or something like that that's increasing in value year on year, theoretically? But I meant more so some of the stuff that we've seen. GT3 RS, prime example, things that maybe have eased off during COVID or over the last 18, 18 to 24 months, but are now picking up in value again. How do you handle residuals and things like that? We we probably say on the, uh, the the moderns twelve to twenty years is probably a good good indication age wise for a Looking modern classic. Yeah, but uh, everything dropped off during COVID at the very start. But how good does it come now, Tony? Yeah, yeah, uh, unbelievable. But, it's, but it will drop back off again. By the yeah, way, so this is just a this is just a we're in a, a little bit of a bubble. Yeah, we're in a bit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but I don't, ha- think, I don't think it goes bad. But. Uh, yeah. But how, so how do you finance around that, right? Because if you get someone naive or cocky or who's bought high or bought low and you're presenting, uh, can your, do your residuals fluctuate with those prices or do they have to stay fairly solid? Like, how do you advise on that? I think key thing at the moment is the, uh, um, the, the market for the used cars is high. Uh, values are strong, but you've still got a lot of conservatism in the marketplace and the lenders because they're, they're not sure. They're still coming out of the, the, the pandemic um, they're all still working from home, so they're not wanting to be quite as, I think, balls is the word as they were before. Um, but certainly with, with some of those, on the, the hot hatch has been a lot of those on PCP. So there's no risk to customers. Hand the car back if you get to the end of the term. But so they're, they're all on secure. percentages as well. There's, the banks work it out on percentage. So their percentage is always for them essentially the the risk so they'll always be the right way the banks they're never they're never really the wrong way and if they are the, if they are going to think the wrong way they won't offer a pcp on it they'll offer a hp balloon essentially which is what they do on bigger cars for that reason customers risk yeah. okay so so if you've gone in there and you thought oh, i've i've just been watching these whatever car and it's been trickling up and i'm going to buy now this is a really strong moment you can't, you're not in a position to then argue with someone the likes of you being like, well, why are you giving me such a low residual? I would have thought that, like, people don't have that right, basically. No, they don't. And also, something like that, you turn around, if it is a low residual, well, it's only in the customer's interest because they're going to be paying off more capital. So even okay. if they want to hand it back, they don't have to hand it back if they've got equity in it. So gone are the days of the cheaper payments. It's all about now making sure that the, the customer's in a much more conservative position. Because they're very, you know, the FCA, which regulates all this, it's very customer focused and customer orientated now that everything's for the customer. So what me and my, me and Tim do is all got to be focused on the customer because otherwise we pay for it essentially. So we have to be very careful on how we do our business. A key, key term is treating customers fairly. Yeah. That's the whole concept. Well, and I remember when we first started working together and I've touched on this in various bits of, you know, videos or stuff that we've done before. Um, you know, you really educated me in that, that don't chase a lower monthly payment. Because all you're doing is screwing yourself over at the end, which yeah, come back and get you at some stage. Well, that's yeah. exactly it. So, and I, you know, I think I've tried to tell people that, but I just I didn't know how that worked in today's market with you know prices f- fluctuating quite so much, and then this increase in modern classics. And I say things whether you know that kind of plays into it. But well, the, other, get, the other key one is everyone's done six thousand miles per annum. Okay. Everyone says that just again because yeah, yeah. they get the higher residual. Yeah, but actually, okay. yeah, if you're going to hand the car back, you'll get stung with excess mileage penalty points. Yeah, interesting. Okay, so. Basically, just it's a bit like insurance. <laughs> the less you uh, declare, the more you're going to get bitten if you have to do claim. Of course. <laughs> You've got to represent yourself fairly. The banks in general are never normally wrong because, as we said, they work on a percentage. So, roughly, it's about 50%, roughly. And that might be a bit more, might be 60. But if, you, if you're borrowing 200 grand, your balloon will be somewhere between 100 and 120, won't it? On, yeah, a, on a four, uh, roughly. On, on a de- decent car, yeah. On a, yeah, on yeah, a decent yeah. car. And if you're borrowing 20 grand over four years, your balloon will be between eight and 10, roughly. So it, it's a percentage thing and the banks are normally not wrong. 
I think sometimes, especially from, I mean, I remember for me, even just 10 years ago, but some people who send me messages, you know, when you're financing a car, it's like, oh, how much can I get away with per month? Okay, I could spend, I could spend 500 pounds a month on a car. Like, I just need to find the best car ever for that money. And you're just chasing that monthly figure when my dad always told me, actually, you should really only you know, finance when you've almost already got the money. You're just you're just using the money better. You're using finance to, you know, manage your, your money and your cash better. Um, but for example, interest only is something that a lot of people on the Patreon page were asking about, you know, how, how can interest only work? Is that something that is a bit of a con in the sense where you think, oh, that's a cheaper monthly, great, what a benefit, but actually isn't always a good route to go? I think the only way that interest only, the, the only way we can facilitate that now is with a big deposit. So you have to okay. stump up money up front yeah. because interest only will only work with the residual that the lender wants to put on. Correct. We'd, we'd normally say a two-year deal because you'll get a high residual and probably 30% deposit, 70% residual at the end is a rough guide of where you're going to be with that. You can't go and do a four-year deal and put no deposit down and say, I want to do interest only because, you, again, you're going to have obviously negative equity. We've okay. touched on plenty of times in the past. And that's the problem as well with buying classic investment cars on finance because sometimes the car doesn't go up as much as you're paying in the interest. So what are you doing it for? You're not, you know, if you're buying in cars and investment like a painting, for instance, and you're borrowing the money, there's a charge to the money. Of course everyone knows that. It's like when like mortgage. When you when when you buy a house, you end up paying more than double the house over the twenty five years, obviously. That's why people pay their mortgage down. The car's no different. So if you're buying something as an investment like a classic car and you're borrowing the money you have to make sure that the car's definitely going to go up that amount. Well, your, your return's got to cover your interest charges. And, well, more, and more, because yeah. what's the point otherwise? You you know, you're, you're, you're doing it for... This, this is the thing that really gets me about the social media world as well, because it's, it's driven by that, and people forget that, that you're paying all these interest payments, and it works the same on uh, interest only as well, which is what, what Tim said. I think buying a classic car you got to pay pound notes for it and then just hope it goes up. And it's money that you don't need, essentially. Really good point, because everyone talks about classics. We fund very little. Yeah. Classics. Really? Just, yeah. Just, just don't, don't get involved. We can do them. Yeah. Someone wants to do, we'll do them. But um, yeah, just not, not as many, I think, as people people expect. Yeah. And is there at some point, so I'll use my sister as a prime example, right? She's just gone out and bought a sixteen one six thousand pound uh, Jeep Renegade. She oh, bought yeah. it? She bought well it. Well done. And congratulations, congratulations to my sister. Uh, speaking to the dealer, they started talking about financing and PCPs and HPs. And it was, you know, it was just getting a bit expensive. And I thought, this sort of seems mad for such a little amount, theoretically, in inverted commas. That makes me sound a bit out of touch. But, you know, in terms of car values. And Tony said, well, look, why doesn't she just take that deposit and then just borrow the money from the bank directly as a bank loan rather than a car financing? So in your world, I know, you know, magnitudes themselves specialise more in the high end stuff, but... Is there a bit of a peak where you're like, you know, sub 25K or sub 20K, there's not Abs always the oh, benefit no, of financing? Absolutely. Cheapest way to buy a car is to go and pay cash, ultimately. Always then, has been. Yeah. You then hear people say, oh, well, can you make your money work harder for you? Then, yes, there's a little bit of a degree in that. But if you've got the money, go and buy the car outright. Okay. Uh, we do have some people that come to us and say, listen, we want 10,000, 15,000 pound. And we... <laughs> Rightly wrong, we direct them to Sainsbury's Bank, Mark Spencer's <laughs> Bank. And so do I. Out there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So do I. Yeah. 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 The, the rates are 3.9, 4.9 APR, yeah. Yeah. and it's in your, in your account the next day. Um, the upside to doing that is you're actually building your credit rating. So that's one thing I will highlight that it's worth doing, okay. because once you get your credit rating going, um, that helps you later in life as well. Sure. Yeah, cheapest way, yeah, if you've got the pound notes, go and pay for it. And it's always, um, just so you guys know, it's probably a little bit easier to get a car on finance than it is to get a personal loan because they've got the asset to guarantee. So if you've never had credit before, you might you might be easier getting a car loan. You'll pay a little bit more money. Unfortunately, that's, that's what happens at the start because these banks, they'll only lend it at, three percent four percent if you're absolutely top prime that's the headline rate that's, so that's get, your headline yeah. rate and you also have to be careful when you're getting this money from the from the you know the the superstores and that is that they are i told you this that make sure that whatever they're offering you when they send the docs that them because they tend to change so it can be um, a bit sneaky with that sometimes. car finances that doesn't happen because it's really heavily regulated but at least they've got the asset if you don't pay. So it is a little bit easier than getting a personal loan from that respect. Okay. Um, one thing which I wanted to query, which I remember was something we did want to talk to you about, was EVs. 
and financing of EVs? Because we've spoken a lot. What's the used market for EVs these days? So therefore, I guess, what, what are the residual values when it comes to EVs? Has that been a whole new world for you to embrace or has it actually been pretty straightforward? It's been fairly straightforward for us. As you know, we're early adopters. We're, we're massively into it. We've got over over 30 Teslas in our fleet at the moment <laughs> at DSG. You're right, Tony. Yeah, I'm fine. Um, but he didn't bring it today, did he? No. What we're struggling with is the... Uh, you can't leave it alone, can't, can't, You can't can't leave it alone every time. Um, what we're struggling with is the, the lenders understanding that is the battery life going to be seven years? Is it going to go conk at the end of seven years? And they've got mm. no asset then. Mm. So that's something that will develop over time. I think the oldest one we've got in our fleet's five or six years still going strong at the moment. Yeah. No, no, I think, I think they'll be fine. Ten, yeah. you know, time will tell on all these electric cars. And, and we're not going to talk about it, but... I was sitting on Vauxhall Bridge the other day. Okay. Traffic I thought both you were going to you gonna jump. Yeah. Well, <laughs> thinking about it. When you saw what I saw, you would have yeah. jumped. No, the, there was traffic everywhere, right? And all you can hear is engines running. And actually, at that point, there was a bit of a light bulb that went off and thought, well, electric cars would make sense at this point, at this time, no emissions, nothing's running, you know, all the stop start, you could constantly hear cars turning off and turning on. That bit makes sense. I'm just checking, Tony, did the light bulb go off or on? Yeah. <laughs> you never quite know with them. Yeah, yeah. You never quite know with me, yeah. I don't know. Was so battery good, operator? Good, good, good luck at that point. But, um, I, well, I'm normally quite nice to him. I'm going to get him. No, 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 <laughs> please don't. Please no, don't. No, no. But, um, yeah, the, at that point, it did make sense. And for the city... In the city, I always think that... If you can charge it, though. Yeah, let's not get into this. Let's that's not a whole, get that's into a whole it. Other, we'll, we'll, whole we'll be here all day. We'll yeah. literally be all week, I've got mate. to get my electric train home. <laughs> 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 what about the coal one? Then? Um, <laughs> and the only other question which suddenly popped into my mind. So when it comes to, um, we were talking about borrowing money from the bank, sometimes if you lower it. When it comes to dealers versus someone like you guys, is there an, uh, I was going to say not emphasis, but... Does a dealer, is it easier sometimes to get finance through a big Audi network or through BMW, through Mercedes, because they're sort of churning the beast and they're willing to take more risk than going to an independent? Yeah, I don't think it's necessarily... You know what I mean, though? Yeah, is that, was that a silly question? Month, I think it depends on the time of the month for oh, a start. But okay. yeah, where, where figures are. But yeah. Um, yeah, they've obviously got a vested interest to make sure that their finance goes through. Um, but a lot of it's down to credit scores these days. They, they, they look at the, the credit report behind the scenes and that's what they base it on. So is it easier... Um, I'm going to say not, no, because no. ultimately everyone's looking at the same credit score. Uh, they might just make it sound like it's easier in-house. But what do you think, Tony? Because you're obviously independent. Yeah, I mean, they will have a bit of a buffer, though, the manufacturer. So obviously they're targeted on... Everything's targeted and revolves around money, unfortunately. We know that's the way of the world. But what they'll do is, is that, uh, for instance, someone like Volvo for a manufacturer, they use um, Santander as a bank they'll have a, 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 a pool of money that guarantees the Santander money. I'm going really deep here, but I'll quickly explain it. So it means that the level of customer can be not iffy. You've still got to be a good customer, but if there's a slight discrepancy, they'll probably still lend the money because the manufacturer will half back it. They don't, back, they don't unwrite it all, but you've got manufacturing money if it goes wrong. It would be all part of the deal, essentially, of well, how they package the The other the thing is, if it goes wrong, they expect that card to go back to the retail network Correct. where they can get, obviously, second bite at the cherry, don't for it. Tim doesn't have that because he's independent, essentially. So, um, yeah, that's how it works from a manufacturer point of view. They'll always, you know, they can stand hard a bit, they can stand a bit harder, essentially, than, a, than an independent. But then, I suppose, at least from my side, or the cars that I've financed or the stuff we've done, you've definitely been able to get me finance or be creative or find me rates or whatever it might be the manufacturer I mean the McLaren's a prime example right that 540c I think whoever McLaren were using at the time slightly laughed me out of the out of the building yeah, I think now the, uh, the JBR the, then yeah, JBR. Was it, was it JBR? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. the regime's changed now everyone's on fixed rates yeah. so actually oh, okay. going into a main dealer their fixed rate is going to be much higher than what ours is because that's where they've set it. That's yeah. where their, their base travels. So they can't negotiate down like they used to do. They might be able to throw some freebies in to, to get the deal over the line, but that's where we're definitely winning at the moment. Aware right. that manufacturers are also different to Tim and myself is that they set the residuals really high, so it looks like the monthly payment's cheaper. But if you uh, look at the deal overall, because what happens is they want the car to go back in the network. They don't want it to come to, to myself or Tim. So they put the residual really high. Mercedes are... Sorry, Mercedes, but they are they are classic for it. They'll okay. set balloons stupidly high, so the car definitely comes back in the network. 
Um, is that when they said you and you bring the car back and you'll have a couple of grand, you know, to put into your next car, and then you take it back and they go, oh, I'm so sorry, sir, you're actually a negative equity, but we'll wipe that out if you don't worry. But if it's a PCP, yeah, that's, they're not they're not wiping nothing out because it's guaranteed. So they might say that, but they can't, you know. It they'll, is a they'll, bit they'll try naughty. and retail out of it again, won't they? So that's what they do. Yeah, yeah, they're inflating the prices to keep the old in house. It, it's all kept in house, and the finance company dictate that to an extent as well. So at that point, it's almost like leasing. I don't advise leasing, by the way, but that's a whole different story. But but it but it is. You are basically renting a car for three years until your new one comes, and you're just rolling all the time. So. Uh, I thought I'd look back on the Patreon page to see if any more questions have popped in. Um, Max Millam has said, uh, uh, do salaries determine the affordability of cars? For instance, with a mortgage as a very rough rule of thumb, it'd be salary times four. So I wonder if there's a similar theory with car finance. I think uh, it's definitely going to be, yeah, help the more you're, you're earning, obviously. Uh, but it's all about affordability now. So when you actually go and apply for finance, they will look at what your income is, but they'll also look at what your outgoings are. And we had one uh, last week where the guy, 100 grand on his uh, tax return, yep, looked great. But he had £120,000 going out a year. <laughs> oh, a year, no. A year. So, oh, no. And that, that, that was net, so something didn't stack up. So you have, yeah. we have to dig deeper. And then his income was split with his wife. He had director's loans. It got very, very complicated. But that's the kind of thing we're looking at, affordability. And that's that's not necessarily the lenders. That's the FCA in general that are dictating that now. Okay. Everyone has their own different models of what they're looking at. Fair enough. Uh, I'm just quickly looking here. Could you explain how interest only fund? I uh, see interest only. We've we've touched on that, Andrew. Love, love their interest only, don't they? They really. Uh, there was a lot of questions about I that. I can give you some advice about interest only. Don't do it. I, I always think it sounds so scary, yeah. but obviously the monthly is so interesting. Now this is interesting. Matthew Binden. Okay, I've put in an example to see if I'm right on the on the right lines. If I put six grand in to a sixty k Ferrari California, have it for six months, and sell for fifty seven grand. Would I get three k of my six k deposit back? Are you going to sell it to fifty seven grand? No, no, no. This is all hypothetical. Where, where, are, you no, gonna, no, where, no. Are, you, where are you going to buy it from for sixty grand? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think Matthew is just you know is making up I some figures put, yeah. here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the point being, it's not always as simple that the man maths, right? Well, no, let's, let's let's go back to the interest only there because if someone puts thirty percent deposit down and then after two years. Uh, the, the car is only worth 70%. You don't get any money back, but you've had cheap payments. Yeah. If you sold it after 12 months and you, you got 85%, you get 15% back. Mm. But you've but, lost your deposit, but you've lost, your, you've lost your deposit, Correct. yeah. So it's it's all to do with... The only the only benefit of interest only is if you want a cheaper monthly payment. Yeah, and I think, what Matthew, what you haven't touched on here is, is what the monthly payment would be. You've just gone for the buy and sell element. Um, I think very, very, very quickly there, I would be saying, Matthew, you're not going to get any deposit back. No. And another thing, Matthew, or find as well, a 60K California. another thing that I picked up from that as well is that what people often think is that when they get a loan agreement out straight away, say their payments are £1,500 a month, the first few months, it, it's all interest because the interest is front-loaded. Mm. So if you borrow 60 grand, say, and you sell it after six months and you think, oh, I've only, I've only, I only owe 62 grand, I bet you don't. I bet you owe 68 or 69 still because... It, the, the, the interest is front loaded because the banks don't do it for nothing. Why should they? Mm. They've laid the money out. Would you? No. The general public. <laughs> exactly. If you, if you, and when you think finance is unbelievable in terms of value for money, you know, someone, someone gives you an amount of money. If I said to you, give me, give me 50,000 quid and in four years time, I'll give you 60,000 back. You tell me to piss off. <laughs> No, you yeah. would in four years. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. unbelievable when you think of it like that. But because they do it in such volumes, they lend billions and billions of pounds. It makes sense to them on their balance sheets. That's how you know it's how it works. But but no, yeah, good, good, yeah, good good point because yeah, the interest is front loaded, even though it's a regulated yeah. facility, which is what yeah. we all always advise. Interest is front loaded. Yeah, all the all the interest back apart from a small thirty day penalty normally. Correct. Uh, but yeah, you are paying more interest to start off with. And the longer you have the agreement, so once you get like two or three years in, then obviously you're paying a chunk off the car. But the initial six months, maybe even the first year, you're paying something off, but you're paying a lot of interest. It's like a mortgage from that point of view. is A mortgage is years before you actually start really paying it down. But but it, it's similar. A bit of a plug, but we do have a settlement calculator on the website as yeah. well, which is really useful. So you can okay. go on there and see what you will owe in six months, 12 months, whenever down the line. Yeah. Amazing. Okay, well, look, I think uh, fundamentally, I feel like we could be sitting here talking about finance all day. It was supposed to be a nice uh, general car news uh, episode, but Tim, whenever you're here, we always like to pick your brains on things. And definitely, I know lots of our 
viewers and listeners uh, had questions for you. If you guys have more, uh, either drop a comment below this episode or tweet us on. You can find Timmy. You got your, is your own Instagram public now? Am I going to completely yeah, 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 out no, you? Yeah, yeah. yeah, Tim, 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 score magnitude. Tim underscore magnitude. So you can just slide in those DMs and ask him more questions. Oh, oh that's going to that, actually that, ruin. That well, that's that's going to ruin your life now. <laughs> um, but always, thank you so much for coming on. We really appreciate it. And nice to nice catch to up. Anyway, all. absolutely, we'll have you back anytime. Uh, Tony, unfortunately, you just never go away. So yeah, you'll be here next week. Oh, I weren't uh, here the other week, and you miss me. <laughs> oh, no, that's a good point. Actually. <laughs> yeah, so that's that. <laughs> but no, I shall see you on Sunday for the for we the first are, live yeah, show. Yeah, yeah. So just a reminder, we do have more of those live shows coming up. The dates again: twenty fifth of July, fifth of September, twelfth of September. Cars and coffee live podcast. Tony roasting cars. Everything's going to be kicking off. It's going to be tons of fun. So head over to my website to check out and buy tickets for those. And I guess yeah, we'll be back with you next that's week. It. Okay, Fantastic. adios. Bye bye. See you.